You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Now, last week I told my wife we need a home improvement loan. She gave me a thousand dollars to move out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, today was a pretty stress-free day, or I should say yesterday, for those of you listening on Friday. Not a lot going, a lot going on. Everybody just got to calm down. That is except for John Kuhn. I... <laughs> I didn't, maybe it's just because I didn't spend a lot of time on Twitter, but I was just checking it once in a while. And uh, for some reason, John Kuhn wants to fight Mike Florio, which I don't know what Florio did. He probably doesn't deserve it, but um, I want it to happen anyways. So Mike Florio over at Pro Football Talk um, wrote an article basically just talking about John Kuhn says that, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers' situation is fixable. Now, I mean, it's a pretty... I mean, as far as, I guess, jabs go, there's not a lot here. He just lists in here, uh, last week, former teammate John Kuhn and James Jones made it clear they believe, based on conversations with Rodgers, that the situation can be repaired. Kuhn, appearing Wednesday on NFL Network, reiterated his confidence that the solution can be achieved. Then there's a long paragraph quoting what he said. Goes on to say, much has been made of multiple reports that the Packers have at some point uh, this offseason offered to make Rodgers the highest paid uh, player in football. Blah, 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 blah. The last paragraph is kind of where he goes a little bit off the rails, more or less saying that um, Aaron Rodgers is kind of prompting them, I guess you could say. He does say it's it's not without Aaron Rodgers' approval, but then he goes on to say that it sounds like Aaron Rodgers is laying the groundwork to kind of turn this around on the media's making stuff up, which would imply that he's kind of sicking John Kuhn and James Jones on things, uh, on, you know, on the media, I guess. And I'll be honest, I had to Google the word surrogate just to make sure I understood the exact definition. Because it's one of those words, like, I could use surrogate in a sentence and feel confident that I'm using it properly. But if somebody says, how do you define it? It's like, I, I'm not entirely sure. I give you a sentence, but I couldn't give you an exact definition. But it's really, it's a substitute. So, I mean, he's, he's saying, essentially, he's speaking on behalf of Aaron Rodgers, right? He's sort of the mouthpiece or the spokesperson. So, I mean, it's aside from the implication that um, this is kind of just a friend talking, pretty benign comment, article, whatever. John Kuhn just comes out full throttle. <laughs> and this is, I mean, it's 7.53 p.m., so it's possible the guy was throwing back a couple. I'm not really entirely sure. Again, he's not being very nice, and he never really is. But John Kuhn just slaps him in the mouth with, I will remember this, Florio, and I will find you. Let's have a chat. Someone please at him. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I don't know that it's a threat. Certainly sounds like a threat to me. Um, Florio then followed that up with, hey, Twitter, if I end up dead, search the trunk of John Kuhn's car, please. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I get the impression it's one of those things that's been kind of building over time, you know? Could definitely use another marriage analogy, but I think you get the idea. I think I've already used that one anyway, so I don't want to do it again. Otherwise, I feel like things were relatively civil, just from what it seemed. But with that being said, I do want to go over something uh, kind of to elaborate on what I said yesterday, and then um, I guess move off it and move on to some new stuff. But I mentioned yesterday the fact that I feel like the Bortles thing is more so than... uh, or at least that it's it's unusual. And, and a lot of people, as I said, said, no, it's not that unusual. So I did. I went back and I looked at all the prior number three quarterbacks. And this is kind of the list that I came up with. Now, you can debate it, and that's fine. And we can kind of go through each individual year. Uh, but remember, I'm talking about there's already a number one guy. In this case, it would be Aaron Rodgers. And I think at one point it was Brett Favre. There's already a number two guy which is the guy that if if the number one guy goes down is ready to play, then there's the number three, which is not that guy. The list that I compiled was Boyle, undrafted free agent, Callahan, undrafted free agent, Tolzien, undrafted free agent, Coleman, seventh round pick, Harrell, undrafted free agent, Shepard, undrafted free agent, Flynn, seventh round pick, Ingle Martin, fifth round pick. That's the whole list. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, what about, uh, even I brought it up yesterday, in 2013, we brought in two veterans, and the interesting thing 
about it is that prior to, uh, let's see, if we go back to, I don't know, August, August 2013, the, we had Graham Harrell and BJ Coleman as our backups. We did not have a true number two, which is, again, I'm defining a number two, not just some nebulous term, but as a guy that is going to take over when the number one guy goes down. This is after Flynn left. So now that Flynn is gone, we don't have that guy that we feel comfortable with. And understand, I'm not talking about a good quarterback. I'm just talking about a guy that we feel like can go out there, can actually execute plays and be somewhat competent. Recently, that guy has been Boyle. Again, not super fantastic, but he was an undrafted free agent. He was a, you know, third guy on the depth chart. And he worked his way up to being a number two. Not a very good one, but a guy that understands the system and can play well enough to kind of be that guy to fill that void. In 2013, they didn't have that. And by, let's see, by September, the only two quarterbacks on the roster were Aaron Rodgers and B.J. Coleman. So Harrell was now gone. The very next month, the only two quarterbacks on the roster were Aaron Rodgers and Seneca Wallace. And remember, Aaron Rodgers did go down this year and Seneca Wallace did come out and start. So that it, it really just goes in this exact same direction of you need a guy that is a number two that can step in and play when ready. I don't think Blake was brought in to be the number one. I think he was brought in to be the number two. Whether that's because Jordan Love is not ready or because Aaron Rodgers is on the way out or we're just hedging again, maybe Aaron Rodgers is going to leave and or maybe Jordan Love won't be ready to be the number two, which again, I think is completely reasonable. That's why I'm coming to that conclusion. Make sense? And again, you can go through, and I think there was one other slight, um, well, what about this, that, or the other? It's kind of way back. Oh, um, Brian Brom. Technically, Brian Brom was a number three, and he was a second overall pick. However, Brian Brom was drafted not to be the number three, but to essentially be, I don't know, like Jordan Love? I, I I don't know. But that was the intention. Matt Flynn just happened to be a lot better than Brian Brom was because Brian Brom was just a really bad quarterback. So Matt Flynn ended up ahead of Brian Brom. So what you had was Aaron Rodgers and then Matt Flynn and then Brian Brom. But they got brought in in the same year. So they didn't have anybody. They needed quarterbacks. They got one really high, one guy really late. Obviously, the expectation is Brian Brom is going to be the guy that's the really good quarterback, and then Matt Flynn will just be the project number three, and it just didn't work out that way. But they didn't bring in Brian Brom to be a number three, and obviously he wasn't a veteran. They drafted him, but that's just maybe another slight point of contention on that point. But again, I just I don't see examples of the Packers bringing in veterans to be number threes. Not that it's impossible. I'm just pointing it out. Um, in the news today, the Packers have signed a bunch of players. As of right now, Cole Van Lannon, the sixth-round pick, as well as T.J. Slayton and running back Kylan Hill have all been signed by the Packers. Uh, I say this every year, and it, I guess I don't really need to say it, but I, I don't really understand why this is such, such a big deal. It, it kind of becomes like a big thing. Like, dude, they, he signed. He signed. They signed. Like, are we worried they're not going to sign and they're going to leave or what? I don't know. But they signed, and the other guys will all eventually sign. I don't exactly know why things take as long as they do. There must be some kind of a structuring thing going on. I don't know. But um, for those of you that were worried that, that you know they haven't signed yet, you can breathe easy. Uh, they are officially Green Bay Pack. I mean, it's an exciting thing for them. No question about it. It's a big deal for them, for their families. Um, it's an exciting time. As far as the fans are concerned, they're all going to sign. So, I, you know, whatever. But it's a thing. It's news. Didn't say it was newsworthy. I just said it was just said it was news. In other news and slightly more interesting news, uh, the Minnesota Vikings have traded away Mike Hughes to the um, Kansas City Chiefs. Now, you know, y- you could argue, well, we got to see the Chiefs anyway, so that stinks. But it's not really a matter of his talent. He's not a very talented football player. Which, by the way, the amount of, you know, the, the Packers catch a lot of flack, mostly from Packer fans, and, and rightly so, about all the early investment in corners that haven't super panned out. The Vikings are, I think, worse than the Packers on that front. I had mentioned, I don't think it was last year, but two years ago, um, the amount of first and second round players, I think their entire DB group was first and second round players, and they ended up getting rid of all of them, and all of them were basically pretty bad football players. Mike Hughes is another one of those guys. First round pick, struggled with injuries, never really got off the ground. In fact, he regressed every single year according to PFF 61 58 and 54 were his grades 
over three years. He's played 917 snaps in three years, which is like one full season. In that time, he's given up 857 yards, six touchdowns, has two interceptions and 10 pass breakups, 102 passer rating when targeted. In 2020, he had a 120 passer rating when targeted. In just four games, he gave up 134 yards and a touchdown with no picks and one pass breakup. He also had a 39 overall run defense grade and a 35 tackling grade. So in terms of the talent, um, it's, it's, it's not so much an issue of you know, them losing a whole lot of talent because they're really not. The, the issue is twofold. Number one, you can't keep swinging and missing on early round picks. It becomes problematic. We saw that with Ted Thompson down the stretch where we were missing on way too many picks and the team began to erode especially on a team that, again, I've said the biggest issue with the Vikings, in my opinion, is the fact that they're getting older and they need to start replacing these guys. On top of that, they've been purging a lot more cornerbacks than they've been adding. Last year, they purged pretty much all of their starters, brought in a bunch of young players. And so you've got 24-year-old Mike Hughes. um, That was one of the ones remaining that is now gone. So there was a a batch of really old early-round picks that didn't pan out that are all gone. Now we got a bunch of really young early round picks, and we're hoping they pan out. Well, Mike Hughes is already gone, so we'll scratch him from the list. That's another first round pick gone. We've got Jeff Gladney, who was a first round pick um, just in 2020. This is the guy that I believe is in prison, or at least is, is, you know, has some serious charges against him right now. This uh, article here was from last month, says he now faces up to two to 10 years in prison if convicted. I'm not going to go over the charges again because I've already given them in graphic detail. You can look it up as, uh, you know, for yourself, Jeff Gladney. And I know there's the whole, you know, we got we got to let the due process and all that work. But based on the details, it sounds like there's like eyewitness reports. One of those eyewitnesses being um, a family that allowed her to jump into their car and speed off away from him. So, you know, we'll see how it goes, but it's not looking great for Mr. Gladney. So, again, big pile of veteran first and second round picks gone. Big pile of first and second round picks. Currently, the two first round picks are gone. They're gone. So, I mean, we've got 22-year-old Harrison Hand, who's a fifth round pick um, from 2020. And we've got third round pick Cam Dantzler, who is actually the best of the group. But, um, you know, that really, as far as his overall grade, it was a 70.9 but really, he just had two good games. He had a 93 overall grade against Jacksonville in Week 13, a 90 overall grade against Chicago in Week 15. Otherwise, his next best game was a 66 against Dallas. Um, he had three games in the 60s, and everything else was a below a 60, which is 60 as average, so below average or worse. I mean, maybe he still becomes something, but again, the issue is larger than just talent. It's the fact that, number one, we keep swinging early, and we keep massively missing to the point where they're not even on our team anymore. You got a bunch of vets playing for other teams, and now you've got one of the guys you just drafted three years ago is playing for the Chiefs. One of the guys we drafted last year is in prison, and uh, two of the other guys that we drafted last year are on the team, but they're third and fifth round picks. And, and again, the other issue is depth. Just the fact that we've gotten rid of so many guys, we've lost so many guys, and we just gave away another one. And I actually just mentioned this yesterday. I talked about the Vikings. I said they got a good team. They've got a good, you know, the offensive line's getting better. I like the quarterback as far as being competent. They've got a great wide receiver duo, a really solid running back. They've got some pieces in place. But the cornerback position is where they're probably struggling the most. And again, they just gave away another guy. Now, yes, they did bring in Patrick Peterson. Good for them. Obviously, that is a short-term band-aid to fix a larger problem, which is that we don't have any players. We did also bring back Mackenzie Alexander, but again, it's just he's not a very good football player. So I mean, it's just it's it's a pretty rough group at cornerback for the Vikings, and and you know again they they sem- semi solved the depth problem by bringing in two veterans, McKenzie, Mackenzie Alexander and Patrick Peterson, but the talent issue at corner is a real problem, and it's actually very similar to what they've had at offensive line, which is we keep taking swings at it, and we're just not really getting better. The offensive line now is slowly improving after multiple swings, like one in three is is becoming competent or whatever. But anyways, interesting to uh, keep an eye on those things. And and again, I don't find that to be insignificant. I'm sure Vikings fans will down downplay it. And I guess as far as again as far as the talent, it's not as big or, or yeah, I, I guess the talent and depth 
you could say we brought in guys that are as good or better, and obviously depth, we brought in two guys, so it's not as big of an issue this year as far as depth. But I do think that there's a larger problem with the Vikings and their inability to find talent to replace the guys that um, that we just keep losing. I think that is a larger issue if we're going to... Um, you know, I mean, look look at where the Packers are at. They're a team that every single year, despite the the pleading and whining and crying from a lot of Packer fans about how this team is wasting the the prime of Aaron Rodgers, they're wasting this out of the other. They don't care about winning the Super Bowl. They just care about winning playoff games or something. I don't know how that logic works, but some people say that kind of stuff. To be just good enough to almost get there, but not good enough to win it. I don't think there's a distinction there, but whatever. Despite all that, the Packers are there consistently they're at that level they have that that kind of a team at what point do the vikings get there i mean they're they're it's kind of silly to compare them to the bears but they're at risk of becoming that right they don't if if cousins isn't their quarterback or if they just don't quite have the pieces if you wait too long before you finally get the right pieces in place everything around it is going to be a mess which is where the bears are at they got fields all right cool but now what Defensive coordinator that built this defense is gone. Half the defense that was here when that defense was real good is gone. A half of the half remaining are nowhere near as good as they were in 2018. Not to mention because of all the losing, we've got people that are disgruntled, like our wide receiver. The offensive line is completely eroded. It just, it's a problem. And if we don't get that specific issue fixed, fine. Your corners are just as good as they were last year. Fine. There's a larger issue at, at hand here, though. If you're actually going to build and continue to get better, it's a simple matter of you got to add quicker than you're depleting. And right now, the Vikings are depleting quicker than they're adding. And that's one of the things the Packers have done really, really well. And as much as we can look at you know the 2020 draft and say they wasted a lot of those picks because they didn't play in 2020, fine. But even with a quote-unquote wasted draft, the Packers are still adding faster than they're depleting, as evidenced by the fact that, again, they went from a six-win team to back-to-back NFC championships because of the ability to add talent. And that's essentially what the gold standard is for all teams. You have to be able to do that. You have to be able to identify the weaknesses and fix them, as well as fix future weaknesses before they come become weaknesses. And so that's the big question I have for the Vikings. And obviously they added some pieces. They had a ton of picks. So we'll see uh, how many of these guys can materialize. So we'll see. Anyways, let's uh, let's take a break here. Since I'm dawdling and it's way later than it should be. I should be done by now. By the way, again, it didn't come up naturally. So uh, I'll tell you, the pizza turned out all right. I thought the, the dough was legitimately unusable. And I know it wasn't great. I Something was wrong. But it kind of just came out heavy, you know, a little, little dense. But it wasn't bad. Homemade sauce. The cheese was a little bit, there's too much moisture in it. It was like uh, fresh mozzarella, but it's very, very wet. And the sauce is kind of wet. And it was a small pizza, so it, you know, the whole thing was just a little wetter than it should have been. But it was good pizza, man. Uh, for the first time ever, I'm, I'm fine with it. Just, just thought you wanted to know. Anyways, I do want to say thank you very much to Mr. Gary Ferries. I know that's wrong, and um, I feel bad about it. Because Gary might legitimately be the uh, the biggest current Patreon donor at the moment, so I apologize. And I for for what you're doing, if you want to educate me, I will study your name and how to say it and get it right. But uh, I really do appreciate the bump in what you're paying on Patreon. Uh, it's really is above and beyond. Also, thank you very much to Mr. Justin Brazzo. I know I've said your name like 500 times. I don't know if it's from Patreon or what. And I always bring up pizza, so I'm going to try not to do that, even though I was just talking about it. And, you know, it it does have two Zs, so. But anyways, really appreciate you guys and all the support. Um, The podcast actually is is doing fairly well. I'm sure the Aaron Rodgers controversy has something to do with it. But uh, so far, I think last year, I just looked at the numbers. There were only two months that went down from 2019 to 2020. And I think both of those were like mental health months. Well, not really. November, I think, was, was lower. One of the other ones was like I took several weeks off or whatever. But so far this year, every single month is higher than last month. So not necessarily from month to month because it's kind of seasonal, but like January compared to January, February compared to February, I've beaten out every single month. And then uh, I just scraped by for May, thanks to a real strong draft season. And then this month is just blowing it out of the water again, I think because of Aaron Rodgers. I'm going to surpass last year's May, like in a couple days probably, so... Anyways, just want to say a special thank you for uh, for tuning in and staying tuned in and all that. But let's take a break, and we'll be right back. 
Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So I did um, kind of last minute have an idea. I wanted to ask some people about um, their thoughts on the 2020 roster. Unfortunately, about two people took it seriously. Everybody else, I think, is kind of goofing around or whatever. But it is interesting because I, I can't remember a time when so much has been up in the air. But we'll look at those couple little little hot takes. Dalton says he thinks that Stokes is going to end up winning the cornerback spot um, over King at some point within the first six weeks. This is my hot take. If you would have said week one, that would have been a little bit of a hotter take. I'm kind of 50-50 on first six weeks. Like 51% Stokes, 49% King. It's tough because there's two conflicting things there. On one hand, you have that that Packers mentality of, I don't care who you are, when you got drafted, you're going to sit until I think you're ready. On the other hand, you have Stokes, who is a first-round draft pick, who they really, really like, and Kevin King, who, I mean, he was basically drafted specifically because we don't want Kevin King to be playing there. So I do think it's going to be as soon as humanly possible so really, it's just a matter of if the guy can play, he's going to go out there. If he's struggling, whether that's the mental side or whatever, uh, just playability, I guess, I don't know, then then I think they're just they're going to wait. I don't think they're going to force him out there, but if he's ready, he's going to go. So that's why I'm kind of, I don't know, kind of iffy on, on week six as far as, it's a, it's a good over-under, to be completely honest. That might be a good poll. In fact, I might just do that now. Week six is Stokes or King the cornerback opposite Jair. I'm not going to do it now because I need to, I need to, for once in my life, stay focused and just get through this. Seth has got quite a few for me. He says, I think TJ ends up starting by week eight. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about to Daryl Slayton. I, you know, it's one of those things. There's probably a really obvious TJ on the team that I'm not thinking of, but I'm going to go with to Daryl Slayton. And starting is kind of tough as far as, um, you know, who's who's starting along the defensive line. I don't know what, what the exact cutoff is for snap counts or whatever, but basically the competition is going to be Dean Lowry and Tyler Lancaster, right? I shouldn't say that, and Kingsley Kiki. And so I guess what we're saying is by week eight, at least this is how I'm going to say it, TJ Slayton is getting at least the third most amount of snaps, which is is somewhat bold because he's a nose tackle. And just by virtue of the position, he's going to be off the field a decent amount. But there's also the possibility that one of these guys, some of these guys don't even make the cut. Oh, man, Goose just reminded me about the Patreon. I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut in real quick just because I'm going to forget. Goose just posted. This is why I have people help me with the podcast. I'm so scattered and all over the place, I can't even remember to do my own stuff. So thanks to Goose, and he posted this in the Facebook group. If we reach our goal, which things have completely stagnated, so I'm not feeling good about it, but let's let's keep it rocking anyways. 300 patrons which is just a dollar a month, by week one of the season. I'll be giving away your choice of either Madden 22, a subscription to PFF, or a Game Pass subscription. You get to pick. So I'm going to be picking one person. You pick one of those things. 
and uh, so on and so forth. Maybe it'll be more than one person. I don't know. I, I, what, we'll figure it out, but somebody's going to win some stuff. It's going to be cool. Anyways, back to what we were talking about. Thank you very much, Goose. I'm semi-leaning toward no on this one, and it's 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 just kind of, you know, and if it's over under, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's not exactly. I would almost set the line for like 2022 somewhere. But it's really, it's just, it's so hard to, to say. Um, Seth also has Martin on the inside. I'm going to say that I like Martin. I don't think he's going to win that job just because I think he was significantly better than a lot of the guys that we had there last year. And he was not given the opportunities. And I also just think he's built a little bit different. Um, they need certain guys with certain attributes. And Kamal is one of the few guys that doesn't have those attributes, which makes him kind of similar to TJ Slayton in a sense to where we need a guy that can do this. And he's very good at this, but that's not really our number one priority. So he's kind of got that secondary stuff going on and he's got it kind of locked down. But the primary stuff, which are, you know, like pass rushing defensive linemen or coverage linebackers, um, you don't do that super well. So again, I'd be fine with it. And it is a different defensive scheme and we'll see how it goes. Uh, It does make sense that it would be him. And then you get the coverage guy to be dropping into space or the nickel, whatever, dime, this, that, or the other. Whatever terminology we're using for whatever defense we're running, I don't know. Does go on to say that he thinks Stokes will be elevated to nickel all year, barring injury, uh, which we know King will be at some point. I'm assuming you mean injured. I want to look at that. I don't think he played. I, I, in fact, I know he didn't play there very much, and when he did, he wasn't great at it. So I don't know if that's just a matter of getting the best 11 on the field, which is a possibility because we want him to play, but we don't think King is going to be off the field. Or if you think maybe he can play well there, I don't really know. I'm going to say that I'm out on that one. I just, I don't think it's going to be a good fit for him. I think he's very Kevin King-esque, which as much as I like the guy, all the positives I say about Stokes, I said about Kevin King, all the negatives I say about Stokes, I said about Kevin King. So it does make me nervous. But at the same time, you like the player Kevin King, you just wish he just did better. And so it's almost like Eric Stokes is a second attempt at the guy that they were hoping they were going to get out of Kevin King. At least that's how I'm going to phrase it to be optimistic about stuff. And then for the offensive line, he's got it broken down. Bakhtiari, Jenkins, Myers, Patrick, and Turner, which I think is fairly straightforward. It is going to be fun, though, because there's so much competition. It's one of those things where I could look at that and say that makes the most sense, but it's still less than 50% because there's so many different combinations. And obviously, Bakhtiari probably isn't going to be back week one. It may be several weeks, but um, this is sort of what we'll call the starting offensive line, right? Injuries are a separate issue. And really, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's just, it really... It, it puts, if we assume we want Josh Myers in there, right, then we got to kick Elton Jenkins where? Probably back to left guard. Now, you could say tackle if you want to. I'm going to keep him at guard, though. So for me, then, it just comes down to, is it Lucas Patrick? Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. Is Lucas Patrick our right guard, or is it John Runyon? Could it possibly be Cole Van Lannen? Could we kick Royce Newman inside? Could it be Simon Stepniak, who we didn't get a chance to see? Could it be John Dietzen? Or could it possibly be Billy Turner and Royce Newman wins the right tackle spot? So there's a couple different combinations, but I will say the one that you laid out probably does make the most sense for the starting offensive line, which again would be David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Josh Myers, Pat, uh, Lucas Patrick, and Billy Turner, which I'm I'm pretty good with. I mean, you, you know I'm not the biggest Billy Turner fan, and, and I mean, when he has bad days, it's brutal, but... Um, I think that's a pretty decent offensive line, and part of the comfort that I have with the offensive line, again, is the depth. We still have, I mean, if anybody goes down, and obviously David Bakhtiari is a different animal, right? When he goes down, it's brutal. The tackles maybe are a little bit different because they're harder to replace, but especially along the interior, I mean, you're talking about John Runyon, Cole Van Lannen, Simon Stepniak, Royce Newman, and we don't know what we have in a lot of these guys, but Jake Hansen, Ben Braden, John Dietzen, Yash Nijman, you got to have some really quality backup sitting in there. So I don't know. I just, I like it. I've been hoping that they were going to do this for a long time and and maybe none of them really pan out, but the idea I have of having a quality starting offensive line and some quality backups just waiting to go, it's such a comforting thing. It's very similar to the QB2 thing, except these guys are, are, oh, whatever. I'll leave it alone. Um, And then he's got Amari gets third most targets at wide receiver to Lazard. Okay, so he's saying Devontae, then Lazard. I'll tell you what. You want my bold prediction? I think he's second. 
And part of that really just has to do with the role he's in, right? I, I know it's, you know, I don't know. I hope you get the impression that I'm not just a homer at this at this stage of the game. But it's it's the fact that, again, if he's going to fill that Randall Cobb role, that's kind of part of what the benefit of that is, is it's heavy in targets. Whereas MVS is big in yards and big plays, again, leave the, the talent aspect aside of it or, or your personal opinions or thoughts. That's what he gives you when he gives you something. You're going to get a 21-yard reception or a 42-yard touchdown, but you're getting one or two a game and that's it. You're going to get that one or two real good opportunities where he's down the field and it's just, a, you know, is the ball on track? Is, it, is he going to come down with it? Whatever the case may be, but that's what he gives you. This is sort of the opposite. He's going to be in the game with, you know, around the ball a lot, whether that's doing the jet sweeps, which a lot of those end up being receptions because they're tosses, depending on, you know, whether they hand it to him directly. That's one of the things he mentioned, actually, when he was interviewed is he didn't actually run the ball a lot. And he's like, no, I kind of did. But a lot of those were tosses, which technically gets considered receptions, but it's the exact same thing. I'm in motion and he just didn't directly hand it to me. He kind of flipped it to me, but it's the same thing. So those are all receptions. But then again, in the slot, a lot of quick move the chain type passes. So I mean, if he's even halfway decent, and depending how much formationally we use him, I wouldn't be super surprised if he's getting, you know, seven, eight targets a game. Maybe not immediately, but I think he'll get kind of ramped up. And it's kind of interesting. I'm looking at this. There's a pretty big gap between Devontae and everybody else. Devontae had 174 targets. The second most was Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Now, he had two more games than Aaron Jones did, but Aaron Jones was third with 68, then Robert Tunyon was 66, then Alan Lazard with 58. So there's some competition there. But if you do the math, even MVS with the second most targets, we're talking four targets a game on average. Aaron Jones, 4.25. So, I mean, if he's able to technically, assuming things don't change too drastically, if he's pulling in five targets, not even receptions, targets per game, he's now the number two. If you look at receptions, Robert Tunyon was getting about three a game. Same with Aaron Jones, 3.25 a game. So if he's getting five, six, seven targets a game, he's easily our number two. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and call that my bold prediction. And then at the 11th hour, Thomas comes in. I was just about to say nobody else uh, actually took this question seriously, so we'll just move along. But uh, Thomas jumps in. He says, quarterback, Rodgers, which, again, is technically a part of this at this point. Running back, Jones and Dylan. Wide receiver, number one, Adams. Number two, Funches, which we got to remember Funches. Number three, Lazard. So not a ton of confidence in the rookie, which makes sense because, again, they, they slow roll all these guys. We didn't see a lot of our rookies last year probably get a heavier dose this year, so maybe it is a next year thing, but I just, again, that's, I called it a bold prediction for a reason. Tight end, Big Bob. Offensive line, he has Bakhtiari, Jenkins, Myers, Runyon, and Turner, so the exact same, but just uh, substitutes Runyon in at right guard, which, you know, if I were to make any substitution to the offensive line we talked about last time, it would probably be putting Runyon in over, um, over Lucas Patrick. Now, that's not to say it's my favorite, and I don't, I don't even know if that, that would be all of their favorite either. I didn't ask for favorite, I just asked for a prediction. Favorite would probably be Royce Newman starts at right tackle and uh, Cole Van Lannon starts at right guard, only because that means that they ended up being really, really good. So, But as far as, you know, if I were to put money down, the two offensive lines that Thomas and um, Seth put forward, I think, um, I think make the most sense. Uh, he's got defensive line, Zadarius, Lancaster, Clark, Clark, Lowry, Preston, until Gary takes over. And I'll, I'll interject here. Uh, he didn't put a timeline on that, but I do think if that doesn't happen week one, I think it happens very quickly. I think at the latest by week four, Rashawn Gary is getting significantly more snaps than Preston. Uh, it's something that we all feel like should have happened a long time ago, and it needs to happen, and I think it's going to happen. Now, again, there's that whole big question mark of the new defensive coordinator, what his plans are and what he wants to do. But if it's true, which is one of the theories that's been posited, and I have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. I shouldn't say I have no way. I I have no, I don't know personally, but it's going to be a much more attacking style defense, meaning we're less worried about our edge guys dropping in coverage and more worried about them just going after the quarterback all the time. Rashawn Gary makes a lot of sense. One of the issues that I had said about, um, Preston and, and the rest of the pass rushers is, you know, with Kyler Fackrell gone, Preston is the only guy that gives you that versatility. He's a much more versatile 
guy in terms of things he can do. Now, Zadarius and Rashad are more versatile in terms of what position you put them at, but the job is mostly the same. You stop the run on running plays, and otherwise you're just attacking the quarterback all the time. If we're going to simplify things for the defensive line, which makes sense to me because I think the DBs are becoming our strength, you put the heavier load on them and you trust them to do their job, and then you ask the guys up front, I just want you to attack the quarterback. Just assault the offensive line, attack the quarterback. If you just unleash them in that way, I think magic is going to happen. And again, I think Rashawn is your guy. So, um, yeah, I, I think in short order, if not week one, at the latest by week four. And I'm just kind of throwing that out there as a random number that's about a quarter of the way through. But I'm in agreement. I'm just going to put a, a solid number on it. Or a, <laughs> it's not very solid. I'll, I'll say week one. I'll say week one. There's your solid number. At the latest week four, though. Um, and then he's got cornerbacks, Jair, number one, Stokes, number two, and then King in the slot, which again, I don't think King's going to go in the slot. I don't think he's built for that. But again, it's, you know, if you feel like it's, we're just putting the best 11 out there, maybe we'll try him in the slot. But that's been, that's kind of the whole complicating thing for me is it makes sense if you just want the best three out there, it's going to be Jair, Stokes, and King, right? That's, that's the easy way out. But I think I don't think any of these guys outside of Jair are built for it, and I don't think you take Jair off the boundary and put him in the slot just because you want the best guys out there, which means we have to bench King or Stokes, which is probably a tough decision a lot of us don't want to have to make, and it's also why I think King's going to be out there longer than we would hope. And 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 again, I, I keep reiterating this because I want to make sure. Here, here's how I see this playing out. If I didn't lay the groundwork for this, here's essentially what I would think would happen. Kevin King would start, and we would very rarely see Stokes. A lot of people would come out, and they would trash Brian Gutekunst. They would say, another wasted pick. This guy's a terrible GM. He doesn't know what he's doing. He can't even beat out Kevin King, and Kevin King is terrible. I would come on the podcast and say, look, that's not really the scenario. Maybe he's not good, but we don't know that. We've seen this as a a pattern with the Green Bay Packers. They like to wait. It doesn't mean he's not a better corner or that he isn't going to take over the job eventually. They're just taking their time. And those people would attack me and say, you're just saying that because you want to tow the company line because you're, you know, kissing the boots of Brian Gutekunst and you're all this stuff. So I'm just telling you now that that is my expectation. Now, if if, uh, Stokes takes over immediately, I think that's an unbelievably good sign. Because, again, the Packers know Kevin King knows this defense. Well, maybe not this defense, but he knows NFL defenses better than Stokes does, right? He's, he's played at an NFL level, maybe not the greatest, but he's played at an NFL level for several years. If they put Stokes out day one, that's a lot of confidence. Not for just any team, but for the Green Bay Packers. A lot of other teams are like, I don't care. I drafted you early. You're going out there. You're a first-round pick. You play day one. I don't care what you're thinking. I don't care what anybody else says. You're out there. Packers don't operate that way, so... Um, and then safety, he's got Amos and Savage, kicker Crosby, and then punter JK47. So I tend to agree with all of those things. Um, with that said, though, I do think I need to get going to Betty Buy. But anyways, I'm going to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Friday. Again, remember, if you want these podcasts a day early and ad-free, check out patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. You can sign up for as little as a dollar per month. You guys have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.